looking for IPv6. In addition to that, Sylvia has an interesting link to Paraguay. Sylvia shares her time between Switzerland and, and Paraguay, and she has a connection to this country. So she will be joining us today and sharing her vision now on the current status of IPv6 and what we need to expand the deployment of IPv6. Sylvia, welcome. Thank you. Oh, this is... So, so we do what? This? This. Okay, so he's already sending you up. Just wait a second. Thank you. So welcome, everybody. You know, I always keep saying IT and technology is a borderline science. <laughs> so, but it seems to work. So welcome to this presentation. And thank you, Carlos and Lucknick, for inviting me. And thank you, Carlos, for the um, introduction. Are you hearing me well? I hear an echo. Is everything good? OK. So, um, I have to say, I speak a few words of Spanish, but my Spanish is not good enough that I could hold this presentation in Spanish. So you will prefer to hear it in English with a Spanish translation. I have to move my screen a bit. So, I would like to invite you today, everybody here, no matter in what in what way you contribute to the internet to move a step ahead and to walk the talk. And as Carlos mentioned, I have written three editions of the O'Reilly book called IPv6 Essentials. And as a consequence of this, I had many consultings with hundreds of large international um, enterprises. And so what I'm trying to do is today is to share all this experience with you whatever is possible in 40 minutes. So, let's start. Did we miss one? That's good, that's the content. So first of all, I wanna address the context. Context is very important when we talk about things to understand from what kind of perspective we're looking at something. Then I'll shortly cover the growth of the internet, especially of the IPv6 internet, and relate to the addressing scheme. Then I will look at the cost and the hidden cost, especially of IPv4, because many people think IPv6 is going to cost them way too much money and they can't afford them that and they would kill them. And the opposite is true. Many companies are not aware of how many hidden costs are in the operation of an IPv4 network. So after we've looked into these issues, uh, we can talk about how can IPv6 help to resolve these issues. And I can show you a business case based on practical experience from a Swiss ISP. And we end with looking at possible designs and recommendations on how could you move on? What does it mean for you? So these are a few screenshots. They are pretty small, right? So what you see here, it's a screenshot from my browser and you see a little green six here, and then you see connections. So this is an extension that I installed in Chrome. It can be installed in Firefox. And when you have a dual stack internet connection, it will show you for every website that you're going to what kind of background connections you have. Is the main connection an IPv6 one? Then it's a green six. 
and what are the other connections. So here you can see that one of the connections in the background is still an IPv4 connection. So now when we talk about the issues today, we always have to see that we talk about three different entities. We talk about users. So in a good future, users have dual stack internet access, which is a job for the ISPs to provide their customers dual stack internet access. And then we need content provider like websites that offer their content over IPv6 also, so that all the IPv6 users out there can choose to view the website in a native IPv6 connection. And obviously, this requires the transport in between the two to also be IPv6. So that's the content. So let's look at this first. IPv4, I would call it is historical. So even though today still large parts of the internet and of many enterprise networks based are IPv4 dominant, IPv4 is based on an RFC number 798, which is 791, sorry, which is dated September 1981. Whereas IPv6 is actually the current standard, it's RFC 8200 dated July 2017. And what you have to know is that all further development of the internet is made based on IPv6. So there will be no further development of functionality for IPv4 in the future. So how big is the internet, the IPv6 internet? And how long will this address space last? I mean, it'd be pretty frustrating if it took us like 20 years to roll IPv6 out. And by that time, we find out that the address space is exhausted. So let's look into these numbers. Here we are looking at IPv4 address space. As you know, the 32-bit IPv4 address provides a theoretical maximum of 4.3 billion addresses. Currently, humanity has about 8 billion people living on this planet. So you can see just by this comparison that IPv4 is never going to make it in the future because these are the people living on the planet maybe wanting IPv6 connections or IP connections in general, but this does not take into account all the always on devices that we need for our Internet of Things services. So here's the gross. This is uh, taken from Google IPv6 statistics. And you see it starts in 2012 when we had the World IPv6 launch day. And it grew from like almost zero up to where approximately around 46, 47% today. And this is seen globally, right? So all countries are included. Now, with the next slide, we are looking at the allocations for IPv6. And we are counting them in slash 32s. You don't see this when I move my mouse over it. So you see at the top, it says number of slash 32s. So just to make sure, for those of you who might not be familiar completely with the IPv6 address format, the full address has 128 bits, of which 64 bits, so exactly half of it, is the prefix. And so from this prefix, we count here a slash 32 prefix, means if an organization gets a slash 32, the organization has another 32 bits. To, for their internal networking, right? And obviously there are other slash or other lengths given out, so somebody might have a slash 24 or a slash 27, depending on their demands, but it's all calculated for this table into how, how many slash 32s is corresponds to. So we, we see today that Across the world, a total of 448,000 slash 32 blocks have been allocated. Now that's interesting because if you think about it, a slash 32 means you have 32 bits to create and administer your own prefixes. So with one single slash 32, you have more address space than the whole IPv4 address space has, right? 
an IPv4 address has 32 bits in total. And here you get 32 bits just for your prefix. So if we look at it from this perspective, the 448,000 slash 32 prefixes might feel like an immense quantity. And we wonder how much did we already give away? When are we running out of it? So I did the calculation, or actually it's done, been done here in the link at the bottom, bgpexpert.com, so it's actualized. And if we take the full IPv6 public global unicast space, then it's the 2000 slash three, these 448,000 blocks represent 0.08% of what's available. So I think we can develop a couple of smart devices and, and IoT devices until we manage to exhaust that space. So this is a really large space. But what I also like to emphasize is when you look at RIPE NCC, which is the European address registry, has like the highest percentage of these. And this has been like this for, for a long time. Uh, we don't exactly know why. <laughs> but what we also see is that LACNIC has the second lowest just after AFRINIC with 3.6%. So there is definitely potential here, right? <laughs> So I would like to invite you to follow me and um, to make this picture look different when we all come together again, maybe in a year's time. So I think we have to look into IP version 6, right, and let go of the past. So let's look at the cost for IPv4. I was working with a large international vendor the last two years. And back in 2018, they paid 1 million US dollar for a slash 16 IPv4 space, correct? So I write with fatal consequences because when you follow me into the next slide, we will see how much cost is created because they had to integrate. They didn't only pay a lot of money for the slash 16, it also created a lot of work, right? To be integrated and used. And then IPv4 has a lot of hidden costs. So that's what I mean by fatal consequences. So they might just better have planned a bit ahead and spent that money on deploying IPv6, which would have solved a lot of these problems. There are many providers like even Azure who are now charging more for IPv4. So like Azure announced, I think it was last year, um, that they are now charging for static IPv4 addresses, while they don't charge anything for IPv6. And there are many providers more and more that you hear that they start charging more for IPv4 services because, than for IPv6, because it's obvious that the maintenance of an IPv4 network costs a lot more money than of an IPv6 network. And I will show some numbers on this. So imagine if you have a slash 16 IPv4 address block and you sell it, the current market price is between 25 to 35 dollars per address, depending on who you ask and how large the, the block is. So if you'd get like 35 dollars for a slash 16, this would be a market worth of about 2.2 million. And many organizations still have larger blocks hanging around. So instead of using them, you better plan to sell them on the market and use the money to migrate to IPv6. And this is totally doable because today we're at a point where most devices and computers and phones uh, support IPv6, where there is plenty of um, translation mechanisms around to sort of make almost any scenario possible. So there is no reason to not go ahead. So let's look at the hidden cost. And that was actually also a customer of mine. We were working together for about a year, and the network working guys were a pretty smart group. And we did, or actually they did, an analysis of their major um, downtimes and incidents that they had had in, over the period of several months. And they were totally um, surprised about the fact that 
almost all cases that they had were due to NAT issues. So to make a general statement, if they did not have IPv4 NATs, but just a, a simple IPv6 native network, they wouldn't have had all these issues. So, and to become aware of this, this is a number that you have to take into account if you make budgets for the rollout of IPv6, you know? You have to consider in those budgets that you're going to save money by not um, needing so many NATs anymore and being able, over the course of the time, to decrease the, the use of NATs and eventually, at some time, phase them out. So the hidden costs come from the complexity of the networks, from the, the fact that you have no end-to-end -end connections. So you need, for certain cases, you need workarounds, which are complex and expensive. You have much higher risks due to the complexity. You know, if something is complex and you have many options and things to consider, the f you, it's just human to have also more mistakes and errors that you do in the configuration. And it's difficult to get an overview of such a network. So you have to do troubleshooting of very often multiple NAT layers, which is also um, complex and time consuming. And you have a poor traceability. The network paths are like, you know, interwoven. And you have, in many cases, overlapping IP address space. Also that you probably know these stories often causes problems with merger and acquisitions because two companies merge that use the same private IPv4 space. So you need to find a solution for this. You cannot just merge the networks. So, and here comes the Swisscom example. Swisscom is one of the three big ISPs in Switzerland. And they joined the IPv6 internet on World Launch Day, which was back in 2012. So they have now about 12 years of experience. These numbers are from 2017, when they analyzed over a period of about five years, how much does it cost us to maintain the IPv6 infrastructure and how much operational cost do we have to maintain the IPv4 infrastructure? And you can see that the CGNAT track, so the IPv4 track, costs about more than four times as much as the IPv6 track. And there is an additional advantage of this, is that the fact that they have a dual stack, that traffic shifts from the IPv4 track over to the IPv6 track, which I will just explain with the next slide a little more de um, detail. So having two tracks being dual stack shifts traffic from the expensive IPv4 transit to the cheaper, leaner, and faster IPv4, IPv6 track. So we have to be aware, we spoke about users, transits, and content providers. Each of us is called to offer IPv6 because then we contribute to the fact that this shift of traffic takes place. So this is, this is a picture, let's say this is an ISP network. Um, they have these two tracks. The, the blue upper one is IPv6 to grow the customer base, and they still have the legacy CGNAT, CGN track for access to the legacy IPv4 internet. And so a dual stack user, if he goes to a website, which is also dual stack, he will always choose IPv6 to connect because that's the preferred protocol. And this is how this unloads the traffic automatically from the CGNAT path. So only an IPv4 user that has no choice of IPv6 or an IPv6 user that needs to access a website which does not support IPv6 will choose the CGNAT track. And everybody else will stay on the leaner, on the cheaper, and on the faster IPv6 track. So we also call this the YouTube effect. So with every website that goes online with IPv6, the many dual stack users that we already have out there will automatically choose the cheaper track which helps everybody in the internet, and especially the service providers.
So, a summary. Why should you deploy IPv6? Well, the first reason is because you like it, don't you? <laughs> the second reason is because it's the current internet protocol since 2011. So I go like, if you're a business guy, why would you keep investing in an outdated protocol? It's, it's end of life since 2011. I mean, if you were upgrading some other technologies, your business guys would not allow you to invest in an outdated technology, but here they don't think about it. So, to me, this is the main reason to do IPv6. It's the internet protocol. And every investment in IPv4 is not, IPv4 is not sustainable from a business perspective. The operation of IPv4 is becoming increasingly more complex. We have covered that point, and so there is a list of obvious main issues, like multiple NATs and middle boxes. And sometimes, if you look at these networks, it's incredible how complex they are. You have address conflicts, overlapping space, fragmented networks, and overly complex firewall rules. So I could tell you a day-long stories about what I've seen <laughs> in consulting companies, what their firewall rules look like. So usually, I, I met one customer, they had about um, 800 rules on, on one of their firewalls. And I said, guys, if we start doing IPv6, can we first clean out this a bit, little bit? They said, oh no. No chance. We have no clue what the rules are doing. We don't know who put them in there. So <laughs> we cannot clean them out. So how can IPv6 help? It has a gigantic address space, a 128-bit address. No more NATs needed. And don't worry, if you love NATs, you can still do them. But I wouldn't recommend it. Each device can have not only one address, but multiple addresses. So this allows for new concepts um, that you can do. You have a uniform subnet size. Remember those troubles with IPv4 with the dynamic um, subnet size mask lengths, causing many errors and misconfigurations. You don't have that with IPv6 anymore because of this 128-bit address. Exactly 64 bits are the prefix. And that doesn't change. So this is sort of much simpler, even though the address is longer. So you have a clear structure of address range. And you can have a focus when designing your address plan to focus on ease of operation and security. You don't have to nibble around anymore. Like, how many users does this location have? And this location gets that much, and the other location gets that much. No, you can make it very simple. Like, same size for everybody. So you can create much simpler and more manageable network architectures. So, and when you design an address plan, get some people to do a second opinion before you implement it. <laughs> some people that have experience in doing it, because there are so many possibilities how to design an address plan that you need somebody with experience in doing it, what kind of things work well and what kind of things don't work well. So one recommendation. So now I want to give you a little dashboard on the status of IPv6 in Latin America. Let me try to switch my screen. Pablo is near if something goes wrong, I hope. I want to show you something live. <laughs> there he comes. So, where do I share again? This. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, oui, it's not very, let me see. I can make this a little bigger. Plus. Well, it doesn't matter if you cannot read the details. I'm just going to sort of give you an idea of what I did. I actually want to create a dashboard 
showing 10 different countries in Latin America, and per, for each country, several categories, like websites of banks, of governments, of media houses, of universities, so that we get like a dashboard of how do the countries compare. And I think Latin America has to see themselves as one big internet, right? So it's not, we are doing better than they are, but it's like, how can we all get better? Because as you have learned, with each contribution of IPv6 to the internet, everything gets better and faster for everybody. So I did not have time because it was a last minute thing to do 10 countries. I just did Paraguay, Uruguay, and uh, Peru. And so I show you here what I did, and then I have a summary in my slide. So if I go to the Paraguay banks and scroll down, there is a script running every two hours which tests, is the website available over IPv6, is the mail server available over IPv6, and is the DNS server available over IPv6. And it creates every two hours an update of this. And so I can compare, these were the Paraguay banks. Let's see what the Uruguay banks do. So we have one bank in Uruguay. It's the Banco Itau. And interesting, on the Paraguay banks, there is also Banco Itau, but it does not support IPv6. So it looks like the two banks never talk to each other, right? Would be nice if they would pick up. And then we have Peru banks here. Oh, they look better, don't they? So this shows banks can do it too, right? There's no excuse for a bank to say, oh, this is too complex and security regulations are too strict. We cannot afford it. It's not true. So it's doable, even in Latin America. So I'm going to go back to my slides. Give me a minute. Where are they? I guess here. Pablo is already on his way, but maybe I made it. <laughs> No? Oh, I did that. Yeah, that's, that's what I did, yes. Thank you. So, he saved my life. <laughs> Last night, the DJ saved my life. Are you DJ? No. <laughs> so, I did a summary of this. Just short overview, very short, quick. We have top 10 ISPs. How many ISPs are in the room? ISPs, hand up, a few? So, I wanna encourage you, please go ahead and help your market, <laughs> okay? So we have 30% Paraguay ISPs, which is actually three out of 10, correct? We have one Uruguay ISP, one out of 10, and in Peru, zero ISPs that support IPv6 on their a website or on their mail server. Then we have top 10 government websites. Paraguay, 30%, three out of 10. Oh, ISPs, they did not move on. Top 10 banks. So zero in Paraguay, even though there is Itau Bank. Uruguay, one out of 10. Peru, five out of 10, that's good. Let's drink on Peru tonight. And then we have the media sites, which is interesting because of, often media sites, they offer a lot of streaming services, so their traffic is a major part of, of bandwidth in the internet. 
So in Paraguay, media is 30 percent, three out of 10. Uruguay, six out of 10, and Peru, five out of 10. So the media houses seem to know how to do it. So you can go and ask them <laughs> how to do it. And then we have top 10 universities. You know, we were discussing this over lunch. I mean, would you send your kids to learn for the future in a university that uses the internet protocol of the last century? Maybe not. <laughs> yeah. So we have one university out of 10 in Paraguay, zero in Uruguay, and three out of 10 in Peru. So, and I'm not showing this to discourage you. The opposite is true. I'm showing this to uh, inspire you. You know, I would like Lucknick to build this dashboard with 10 countries. I can help them to set this up with the scripts that we have been programming here. And in a year's time, we can meet again and we have a big celebration because everybody moved forward. And everybody is happy because they saved cost and they have a much faster internet. So there are like measurements, for instance, several years ago, LinkedIn, after migrating their backbone to IPv6 only, they have done uh, larger studies on how does that affect performance over all the world. And it showed that there was a constant increase in performance in the range of 30 to 40 percent. So it's not just a lot of cost, it's, it's an advantage even, and it's saving you cost. And now to even make it more clear that I don't want to discourage you, is I'm showing you the next slide, which shows Swiss governments. You might think, oh, those rich guys in Switzerland, they can afford it, they do it. Well, look. These are all Swiss government websites. And three out of the 20 whatever support IPv6. And even in the middle somewhere, where if you could read it, it was the e-government website. And the e-government website does not support IPv6. So the good thing for you is it's very easy to do better than Switzerland by next year. So. Good so far? Happy? So let's close the whole thing with looking at what could an action plan look like and what mind shift is required to go there. So your goal is to do IPv6 only networks wherever you can. The only point where you offer dual stack is facing the public internet. Because by facing the public internet with a dual stack access point, you make it possible for every user out there to choose the protocol which is fastest for him. And offering your public services over dual stack does not mean that your internal infrastructure has to be dual stack. You can have internally IPv6 only like, for instance, Facebook does. I think Facebook has not one single IPv4 packet in their network since years. But you can just have a load balancer or an F5 or Akamai or whatever in front, serving the IPv4 legacy people, and everybody else can do native IPv6. So I want to show this just as a very quick example of how you should start thinking about the migration. So these are elements that you find in most networks. You have a core, you have one or several campuses, you have one or more data centers, and you have the transit to the external network and the DMZ. Now, where you start doesn't matter. There are so many um, translation mechanisms that you are free to choose. Now, what is your criteria to choose? The criteria to choose in, um, to preserve money is to follow the life cycles. So let's say your backbone reaches his next life cycle in two years. You will not touch it today. You just leave it for the next two years, but you start planning. You say, next life cycle backbone, we're going to turn it into an IPv6 only backbone. And then you take the two years to deal with your vendors, to do the tests, to find out what kind of equipment do you need to make that possible? What RFC requirements do you have 
for the new equipment and you talk with your vendor early because he might need some time or if he can't deliver you might have to look for a new vendor right so that's how you but you would not change anything in your backbone before the life cycle is ended and the same is true for any compost you don't just tear apart the compost that works and doesn't reach a life cycle but when the next life cycle comes you prepare for this to go IPv6 only or whatever your strategy is. And you can have mixed campuses. You can have one that is dual stack, one that is IPv6 only, or one that is IPv4 only. And now with the data center, you try to go IPv6 only wherever you can. And when you, when you have IT projects to integrate new services or technologies, you will make them IPv6 only right from the beginning. So some customers choose to build a new data center for the future where they only put their IPv6 only services while the legacy services run in the current data center. Other customers, they mix it, they just have separate zones in the data center for the IPv6 only services and the um, IPv4 legacy services. So and to the outside, you want to make sure that you're users can go dual stack to the internet so that they can access um, IPv6 website over IPv6 and that your customers can reach you from the outside over both protocols. So I want to say you are flexible in how to do this, but you need to do thorough and good planning. So that would be a close up on the data center. Like here you have an IPv6 only data center and you have an IPv4 only client, he will access the IPv6 only data center by going through this NAT4.6 box. But the IPv6 only client, he will just go native straight IPv6. So that's basically how you can make this work. So action plans, it's your to-do list so that you're ready for next year's jump to 50%. So the general rule is always all public services should be dual stack. And again, it can be just an Akamai service or an F5 in front or a load balancer. And in the background, you can still be IPv6 only if you're ready. Then for ISPs, go IPv6 only in your backbone and with your services as soon as you can and use translation just for legacy services. Provide dual stack internet connections to all your users because that helps the internet a lot. It helps everybody if you do that. In, in Switzerland, I'm a Swisscom customer. I have a DSL Swisscom account since 10 years. All the DSL users from Swisscom, they just have dual stack. I mean, my neighbor up in the mountains, he has his Macintosh computer and I was checking it. He has IPv6. And I said, hey, you have IPv6. He said, what's that? You know, he doesn't need to care if the provider does a good job. People just have IPv6. And the same is the last point. If as an ISP you offer hosting platforms, make them dual stack. In Switzerland, many enterprises, even some government websites, have dual stack because they happen to host them on a provider that offers dual stack hosting. So, and offer all your own services dual stack. So that's for ISPs. Enterprises, same general rule. Go IPv6 only in your backbone and data center as soon as you can, meaning with the next life cycle. And start for the planning today, please, because otherwise you won't make it. Have dual stack internet connections for all your employees. That's missing in Switzerland. I guess it's probably the same here. Most people, you see the, the things on the Google charts. Over the weekend, IPv6 is higher because people work from home. <laughs> in the office, they don't have IPv6 internet connections, but at home they do. And offer all your public services dual stack. So what does it take to do that? Use every IT project to assess the IPv6 capability of your devices and software. Every time you touch your network, you think IPv6. And you go like, okay, I got to touch this machine. What do I know about its IPv6 status? 
start talking to your key vendors about their IPv6 support and talk to them on a C-level base. You know, if you need backbone routers, this is a C-level issue. And you have to make it clear early enough that you're on a strategy to deploy IPv6 and that you expect your key vendors to support that. And then you expect them to show to you that they have a roadmap and that they have the support that is needed to support that roadmap. Include the deployment of IPv6 in every IT project. Educate everyone in the organization and update your purchasing requirements. That's what you need to talk to your vendors, right? And so there is RIPE document 772, requirements for IPv6 in ICT environments. And there sits Jan, and somewhere sits Sandra Steffens. So two of the authors, they are winking to you of this document sit here, so take the chance and talk to them before they leave. Yes. That's not the first version, so they have many years of experience in this. So and now my last two slides. When I come to a new customer, one of my first questions is, what IT projects do you have ahead in the next three to five years? And then I get a list, like something like this, usually. And it's like IPv6 is at the bottom, and it has been postponed for the last five years because they didn't have time, they didn't have money, whatever. Security was an aspect of every IT project. So I say, this is the wrong mindset. You will never deploy IPv6 if you look at it this way. The way you got to look at it is this. IPv6 is not a separate project. IPv6 is an integral part and aspect of every IT project, just like security. Would you deploy voice over IP without looking at security? No, stupid. But why do you deploy new technologies without integrating IPv6? It's a business case question. So, my second last slide. I'm doing pretty good. Some further reading, you can download the slides from the agenda. I wrote a blog for LACNIC a couple months ago. It's available in an English and Spanish version, which sort of talks about these topics. Then, do you know IPv6 Buzz podcasts? So if you understand English, you should go there, packetpushes.net. There are plenty of podcasts with really interesting, practical experiences from the field. So go there and surf through and look at what's interesting to you. And on the ARIN website, you find five blogs discussing different aspects of the IPv6 business case. So these are some good recommendations. And with this, I close my presentation. And I would like to tell to you, so if you're interested in knowing more about the dashboard, I'll be happy and willing to meet with you out there or in the hotel lobby or whatever. So just come and speak to me. And thank you very much for your attention. I hope it was possible to inspire you. Okay. Do you have a microphone? So Carlos just says we have five minutes for question. If somebody has a burning question. Okay. Anybody have a question? You have a question. <laughs> Come on. Wow. <laughs> Hi, Sylvia. Hi. Uh, this is uh, Sandal Stefan from uh, the Ripe, Ripe NCC board. Um, but speaking on my own behalf here, um, what would you, uh, uh, which company or country or region would you point at if people ask for a really good example of how to do this? You know, this is, a, I would say this is a too general question. Because, I mean, IPv6 is very adaptable. And every network is so different, and, and the circumstances are, so there is no cookbook, you know? The, the most important thing is, when I start working with a customer, like I, I once used to work for one of the largest healthcare providers in California, and they had a burning problem because they ran out of private IPv4 addresses. 
And I said, I'm going to come for five days. We're going to do a layout workshop. We're just going to create a map of what you have. And then we're going to start talking about what you would like to have in five years. And then we start to put the bits and pieces together and find the flow to get from A to B. And that takes time. And I think the biggest mistakes you can make is if in the beginning you don't take enough time to look at what you have and look at what works well and look at where it does not work well. So maybe that's not the answer you expected. <laughs> It, it's good to have nice examples. You mentioned Facebook, who went V6 only. Um, I know Belgium uh, was very early with V6 on the ISP side. So yeah, it, it's, good, it's good to hear how a, uh, an enterprise approached yeah. it. Thank you. And actually, I can add something to this. When you mentioned Facebook, I had done, as I was the president of the Swiss IPv6 Council, I'm sort of still am, but it's asleep, and we did a monitoring over across 30 days, 24-7, of several user connections to a number of about 10 websites. So we monitored constantly so we could go back and, and analyze. And we made sure that the users that connected to these websites were coming from different regions and different ISPs. Right, so we tried to see, is there a pattern? And we wanted to see, is access over IPv4 or IPv6 faster or slower? And it was interesting because it showed that there wasn't a rule. You couldn't say IPv4 is slower, you couldn't say IPv6 is faster, but one thing was standing totally out, and that was Facebook was always the fastest, no matter what. And the only reason we could find is that Facebook was the only of the content providers that had a pure IPv6 only network internally. It, this is not a proof, but it was the only distincting factor, right? So thank you for this comment. Five minutes are over. No. Nope. Hello, Sylvia. Hello. Great presentation. Thank you for. You're being welcome. Here. Thank you. I will do my best on asking in English. Um, have you considered on having this um, this site that you mentioned? Uh, when you are showing us about the banks and the, the dashboard, the, uh, yeah, the dashboards, w were you taking into account that maybe some companies or maybe some institutions are using some broken proxies or something to just to say, hey, I am already using IPv6, and then I, I, I'm, I already did the work and maybe using some broken uh, implementation that creates some problems to the end users. Because maybe this can be a marketing rush, just to say, I, I am already here. And, and, and because of this, having a really bad um, sense of uh, usage to the end user. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's true, you have to look deeper. But basically, if you get this dashboard, you would assume that users can connect over IPv6. It's doable. And so I have two perspectives. Yes, it might be fake, but it might also be a workaround to, you know, until they made it. So let's say Facebook in 2008, I think they had a load balancer that would load balance IPv6 mm -hmm. to the outside because they were IPv4 internally. And today they do the opposite. So it took them some time to migrate everything to IPv6 only. But now today, there are IPv6 only, and they load balance IPv4 to the public. So I say to serve the public and to help everybody else in the public internet, the load balancer is good enough. And they have to struggle with their IPv4 infrastructure internally until they migrate. Yeah. But it's not just fake, you know? Be it, it helps the internet. If I want to be in the list of the good guys or, or the best, uh, examples, I, I can move my website behind some Cloudflare or something, and that's all. Yeah, that, that's but what. then you should go on, you know? Okay. But that's a good first step to do. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So, I'm done.
I was enjoying this.